Hi, I'm Josh Murphy, Research Analyst at Fund Calibre. Today, I've been joined by Chris Ford, manager of the Sanlam Global Artificial Intelligence Fund. Hi, Chris, how are you? Hi, Josh, nice to see you. Let's kick it off then, Chris. Um, I always find it surprising just how much AI is influencing so many parts of our lives at the moment. Can you tell us about a few areas? Maybe start with um, automation and reshoring. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Joss. It's it's, um, touching more and more parts of our lives, as you say, and this is something that we've been seeing throughout our experience running the fund now for five and a half, six years. Um, And one of the areas which is most touched by AI right now and very much in the zeitgeist is, as you rightly say, um, the, the, near, the trend towards nearshoring, particularly in North America, but also in, in, in Western Europe, so bringing supply chains back closer to consumers. Um, and of course, there are costs associated with that. And many of the um, uh, facilities in North America and in Western Europe are going to be in high cost areas. And so finding ways in which those costs can be mitigated, particularly in the subsequent operation of, the, um, of, of, a, of a, a distribution facility, for example, is absolutely key. And in many ways, um, AI is all about trying to help us to do more with less. Um, And so AI's benefits as um, companies look to reshore, nearshore um, their supply chains are absolutely manifold. Um, We're seeing it deployed right the way across the supply chain from uh, widget manufacturers um, all the way up to the OEMs. And of course, all those companies in between those, uh, uh, those, those, those people who are managing the supply chain, managing the flow of goods around the world. So for example, um, we're finding it, um, it being deployed increasingly in the logistics supply chain by companies like GXO, for example, um, who are a leading edge uh, provider of logistics um, uh, facilities to help companies f- allow goods to flow more efficiently through their um, through their warehouses, but also to allow companies, uh, particularly in the consumer space, to be able to um, handle returns um, uh, much more effectively and doing that in a fully automated way. For example, if you've bought a pair of Nike trainers and you don't like them, you send them back for one one, one reason or another, then having a piece of um, artificially intelligent um, software that enables that the, um, the receiving distribution center to um, look at the, uh, the goods as they're returned, identify them for what they are, see whether they're damaged in any way, and then basically send them off to the right place um, without any human having to actually engage in that process this is a huge benefit, not just in terms of money, but also time taken to get that good, those goods back into circulation again and make them available for resale. So just one example of how we're seeing it manifest itself into the, into the supply chain. We're also, of course, seeing those companies that sell the equipment into that process do extremely well. So companies like Kients, for example, a Japanese leader in the world of um, of machine vision, um, really seeing very very strong orders for its uh, its equipment. Cognex, uh, competitor of Kients in the US, also doing similarly. We're seeing great demand for companies that can provide the helping hand to uh, those in the supply chain who perhaps don't necessarily have all of the expertise internally themselves to be able to navigate their way into this world. So companies like Hitachi, for example, with their Ludmada platform um, and their uh, recent acquisition in the IT services space are now in a position to be able to help companies find their way into the AI world and select which technologies are appropriate for, 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 for them. And so I could go on. It, it, it is, as we re-architect the, 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 the global supply chains, um, AI is going to be absolutely everywhere. And I suppose the last broader point I would make is that this is a function of something which we see right the way across the economy. And that is that if you were to be building a facility or were to be starting a new business from scratch today with the benefit of a blank sheet of paper, why would you not design that business with AI absolutely at its heart? And of course you would. So the question for many of these companies, that uh, all the companies, is that how do you, without that benefit of a blank sheet of paper, how do you bolt on AI as an afterthought onto existing business processes to enable those benefits to be to be seen? And we're seeing that happen faster and faster and faster. No, that that all certainly um, makes a lot of sense, Chris. Um, but do, do you have an area that that might surprise our listeners? <laughs> um, I think it's. It, 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 it's difficult to point to parts of the economy which aren't which are completely untouched by AI at the moment, which I think is something which surprises me. Certainly, you know, the the, the persistency and pervasiveness of AI within the economy has been um, uh, quite extraordinary in um, in its growth over the course of the last half decade. Um, somewhere where we've done quite a lot of work more recently is in at the agricultural markets, where 
you know, perhaps seen as a bit of a more sleepy part of the economy. But of course, actually, if you look back over the last couple of hundred years, you see that agricultural markets have been some of those most extraordinarily disrupted by successive waves of technology. Firstly, obviously, mechanization in the 19th century and the late 18th century and right up to the current day. So there's nothing that suggests that um, uh, agricultural markets uh, and the agricultural industries more broadly are um, in any way less capable of being disrupted or indeed bra- embracing new technologies in other markets. And we're finding that some of the things that are being de- delivered into the market now by the agricultural equipment manufacturers, such as John Deere in particular, where we have a position in the portfolio, but also um, some of their competitors like Case New Holland or, or, or Agco, you know, enabling farmers to do more with less again, you know, use less water, use less um, uh, pesticide, use less um uh, less fertilizer um, for uh, change the way in which uh, uh, farmers pay for services, and in so doing, change their business model, change the, the margin structure inside of these businesses over time. All of these are completely transformational, not just for the farmers, but also particularly in the way I care about it, of course, in an investment sense, for the companies that are able to sell those services and, 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 and products. And of course, as we see with John Deere, um, over time, as the margin moves up, as the services mix increases in the revenue line, the market will pay a higher multiple for that. We believe over time, and that's what we're beginning to we're beginning to see. So, I think agricultural markets are something which are worth definitely keeping an eye on. Of course, um, another big theme is climate change. What's AI helping with there? I know Google has just launched Flood Hub. Uh, what's that? And what is else that? What is there else out there? So FloodHub is a um, piece of um, artificial intelligence software that uh, Google developed to help um, identify, manage, and mitigate risk associated with um, with sea level rise, uh, effectively, but also other kinds of more, of more localized um, flooding. Um, and it's probably worth reflecting on the, the the fact that for a very long period of time, actually, meteorological information analysis has been in the vanguard of um, the delivery of artificial intelligence systems. You know, the Met Office in the UK, but also other weather services elsewhere in the world have um, have been using leading edge AI techniques for a lot of a long time now, using them to uh, to to um, inform their, their their predictions. So there's nothing new, really, particularly in what Google are doing. But what they are doing is making that leading edge AI available to a to a to a to a broader group. AI can help in a number of ways um, with um, with, with um, climate change. One of the ways that you've already identified is, is how you highlight the impact of, of climate change and forecast what that looks like forward and then mitigate for it. But of course, there are other things that AI is able to do, um, in particular, again, coming back to this point of doing more with less. Um, one of the things that Alphabet has been doing for a long time now has been using its own AI to manage its energy consumption inside its data centers. And um, Alphabet's uh, data centers are some of the most efficient anywhere in the world in respect of their energy consumption. And that, of course, is a huge hot potato at the moment as um, uh, people now begin to focus on the huge energy requirements which are uh, demanded by data centers around the world. And I think the most recent... um, uh, chat GPT um, conversation has really shone a light very, 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 very brightly on 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 that, where leading edge artificial intelligent workloads are highly consumptive of high powered computing capacity, and there's a cost to that, and that cost comes in the form of of, of energy consumption. So how we call those facilities, how we power those facilities, uh, is absolutely key, and AI has a huge role to play in helping us to understand how that works, and of course that then begins to feed out into the broader. Um, electricity supply chain more broadly, so the management of distribution networks, the management of power generation facilities, all of that um, uh, is um, a, a, a part of the economy which AI has a huge amount to offer. Um, and of course, that then begins to map back into the meteorological conversation that we were having earlier. If you can better forecast uh, the, the, the weather, if you can better understand what wind and, and solar um, generation rates are likely to look like, then you can better manage your, your energy um, generation and uh, uh, configure the grid accordingly. So, you know, there are nested levels of benefits that AI can bring right the way across this, um, this climate change discussion from managing um, energy use managing energy uh, generation, and then figuring out what we could do to mitigate the impacts of climate change where um, where we need to. Now, that's certainly hard to disagree with, Chris. Um, looking back at AI's development over the past decades, we've gone from Google's brain learning how to find cat videos in 2012, to Alexa teaching motor skills to robotic hands and winning chess games. What's next for AI? What's exciting you today? 
Um, I think, well, you mentioned chess, you know, there's always the history, the ability to, to trace the history of AI through its ability to um, overcome games of succeeding complexity. And of course, you know, chess was 30 years ago now almost, you know, we forget that these things are, that things have already gone on. I mean, we now have platforms that are capable of playing Go, but also capable of playing StarCraft and other match, um, massively multiplayer online games. So hugely complex game spaces where AI um, is, um, is is capable of engaging. I think that absolutely continues. And for game players, that will be great. It'll just mean a richer um, AI experience inside, inside games. Um, I think some of the things that we're seeing now with NLP, natural language processing, of which ChatGPT is the most recent um, example to have caught the eye, um, are really important. And, you know, we, we are perhaps a little less surprised and taken aback by the capabilities of ChatGPT than others because we regard this really to be just a natural progression that we've been able to observe occurring over the course of the last 36 years or so um, in the efficacy of natural language processing. But ChatGPT is extremely good, and it is beginning to cross a Rubicon, I think, now, to the point whereby um, the benefits that ChatGPT can deliver are very apparent, and anybody who's had the opportunity to 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 engage with that platform, and I heartily suggest you do, um, will have seen what what it what it's capable of achieving. That that technology we think will be coming into Microsoft Office products over the course of the next couple of years, and that will be really interesting because at that point, when you have that kind of level of um, natural language processing embedded inside um, the Office suite that, of course, we all use every day in the course of our of our work, you know, that's now beginning to deliver fully functional artificial intelligence systems into a front office context um, in a way that we will all engage with on a daily basis. And that's a really exciting um, proposition. So I think that's coming. I think we're going to hear more from Alphabet as well in respect to natural language processing. And we'll, we'll, there'll be a real kind of um, uh, tug of war between Microsoft and OpenAI on the one hand and Alphabet and DeepMind on the other for the supremacy here. And that's just what's been going on for the last few years. I think the other thing I would point out would be What's going on in drug discovery, which we think is really, really interesting and very important. And so um, a couple of years ago now, uh, Alphabet developed a platform called AlphaFold, um, which uh, was a platform developed to address the problem of how to predict and model the way in which proteins fold inside the human body initially, but potentially in other, in other, in other organisms as well. Um, and... The platform, um, without going into huge detail here, has now been um, uh, carried forward to the point that Alphabet um, actually established its own drug discovery or operation called Isomorphic Labs under the auspices of DeepMind um, uh, last year, and sorry, 2021. And um, Isomorphic Labs is the platform that Alphabet hopes to use uh, AI to significantly um, increase the efficiency of drug discovery over the course of the next decade. And that's an incredibly important and exciting proposition um, for, for all of us, frankly. And I think Alphabet has behaved really extremely well as a good corporate citizen in respect of making um, much of that AlphaFold um, intellectual property available for others to scrutinize um, so that it can be understood what it's looking, what it's looking to do. Chris, I just want to say thank you so much for, for giving up your time today. Not at all. And if you'd like to find out more information about the San Lam Global Artificial Intelligence Fund, please visit fundcaliber.com.